protection from heaven, this gift, this anointed vessel that you've sent among us, we receive him. You said if we receive whom you send, we receive you. And so we're open to you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you and we praise you. And as he blesses us, we bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I was going to speak on casting all your care on the Lord. How's that? So open your Bible, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. And we're going to begin in verse 7. But as we begin, I have to tell something funny. Denise and I, of course, have lived in the former Soviet Union now for 17 years. And we just got satellite television. So we can see TBN, Daystar, the Church Channel, we can see it all. So we sat down to watch TV and there was Believer's Voice of Victory. And it was Gloria and Billy talking about nudity and cussing. <laughs> I said, that is the first time I've ever heard him talk about that. And all of a sudden, Billy said, I bind that spirit of cursing. I command you to cease and desist. I said, Denise, I don't cuss, but I feel like I just got bound. <laughs> and then the funniest thing just happened about Brother Copeland. A woman flew all the way from Siberia to the city of Moscow. And she said, I have to meet with Rick Renner. I said, really? She said she had a message from Kenneth Copeland that Kenneth Copeland had sent her to talk to me. I said, well, that's very interesting. I need to meet with this woman. So she came in and she sat down. She said, I have decided that I'm going to immigrate to the United States. And I don't have any money. But Kenneth Copeland appeared to me in the middle of the night and told me that if I would come to Moscow, you would give me all the money I need to immigrate. My staff said, uh, would you please ask Brother Copeland to tell us before he starts appearing to people in the middle of the night? <laughs> thank you for your ministry. Really, thank you. Aren't you grateful for Kenneth and Gloria Copeland? They're wonderful. They're wonderful. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the privilege to gather in this place. And Holy Spirit, we take this as a very somber moment. We want you to speak to us. We all came here to be changed. We want to hear a word from you that's going to make a difference in our lives. And Father, we thank you for every message we've already heard today. And Lord, I pray that when I say amen in this session, words will have been spoken that would have made a difference in the lives of those that are listening. In the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. amen. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about worry. And if you would look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Peter writes these words, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let's all say it together. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. When I was growing up, this was one of two verses in the New Testament that I just practically hated. And the reason I hated this verse is because I did not understand how it was possible to live a life that was carefree. The other verse that I didn't like was in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, where the Apostle Paul commands us, be careful for nothing. And the Greek literally says, don't worry about anything. That means don't worry about anything at all. Thank you, Lord. And I just did not understand how it was possible to live with no worry, no fret, no anxiety. I had grown up in the church, and in the church we used terminology which affected the way that I thought. For instance, we were always supposed to have a burden about something. We were to be burdened about souls. We were to be burdened for our nation. We were to be burdened for our family. And as a young man, I began to think it was normal to all the time be 
burdened about something, and if I wasn't heavy, if I wasn't burdened, if I wasn't worried about something, then I was simply not living the responsible Christian life. If I was a real Christian, surely I ought to be burdened about something. This affected me so much that when Denise and I first got married, I hardly had a day that I was not worried or burdened about something. And it used to just irritate me because Denise was free of worry and care. She would just lay in bed and sleep at night, and I would think, how can she just lay there and sleep like that when I am laying here so burdened and with so much care? Sometimes I'd just reach over her and nudge her, try to wake her up that she would worry a little bit with me. But Denise was totally free. I worried about everything. I worried about the way that I looked. I worried about what people thought about me. I worried about the impact of my ministry. I would teach. Then I would worry about what I said. Then I would worry if people understood what I said. Then I would worry if maybe I didn't say what I meant to say. Just worry, 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 worry. Worry if I had on the right clothes. Worry do people like me. All of those things affected me all the time. I was so consumed with worry that I developed a bleeding ulcer. So they had to put me in the hospital. I was 23 years old, bleeding internally, and the doctor came in and said, Rick, you are too young to be carrying this kind of worry. He said, you need to stop this. And I just didn't understand how can you stop worrying? How can you live a life free of care? And I know that there are many people in this room today who struggle with this. Finally, he walked out of the hospital room as I saw black bug, bags of blood being poured into my veins. And I was watching the news in the hospital room. This was 1985. And all of a sudden, there was a newscast about a new disease they had found <laughs> that was transmitted through blood. And they thought that the blood bank of the United States had been tainted by this new disease, which was so new it didn't even have a name. And of course, it was AIDS. And I looked at the blood flowing into my arm, and I began to think, dear Jesus, I've just been infected with this disease that has no name. When I got out of the hospital, I was afraid to be intimate with Denise because I worried that if I was contaminated, I would affect my wife. Consumed with worry that I was killing, carrying a killer inside my body. So privately, I began to make appointments at doctor's offices. And I would go to have my blood tested. They would say, your test is fine. But you need to know that 70% of these tests are not right. <laughs> and when I walked out of the doctor's office, I would think, dear Jesus, I'm in the 70%. I know I'm in the 70%. So I would make another appointment at another doctor's office to be tested for AIDS. And I'll never forget the day that I went in to be tested for AIDS. And as I walked out, the nurse said, good to see you in our office, Brother Rick. <laughs> and then I began to worry that she would wonder why I was having an AIDS test. It just consumed my life. I never knew a day that I was not worried or fretful about something. And finances upset me quicker than anything else. I would work that calculator. I would re-input those numbers one way, then I'd try it another way somehow. If I could just magically punch them in the right way, maybe the tape wouldn't be read when it came out the other end. <laughs> Denise would say, honey, give it to the Lord. And that just irritated me every time she said that. Give it to the Lord. 
I think easy for you to say, give it to the Lord. People are not calling you to pay the bills. It all falls on me. And this went on for years and years and years and years. And you know, when you are consumed with worry, you don't think straight. You don't think straight. In fact, as we continue to look at these verses, you're going to find out Peter says, be sober. That's because worry has an alcoholic effect. You become inebriated with the cares of this life. You don't see things right. You don't hear things right. You're just like a drunk. You hear things that aren't said. You see things that aren't there. Your emotions are exaggerated. You are on edge because you're inebriated with the cares of this life. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? <laughs> now, notice what he says in verse 7. Casting all your care upon him. This word casting is a particular Greek word. By the way, Brother Happy, thank you for calling me the Greek geek. <laughs> I haven't been called that in many, many years. Jerry Savelle just told me to, you frisbee. <laughs> but this particular word for casting was used when a man was carrying a load so heavy that it was far too heavy for him to carry all by himself. The load was so heavy that you would call it a load that would break him. It simply was physically too heavy for one person to carry. So he would call for someone to bring him a beast of burden. Usually it was a camel or it was a goat or it was a donkey. And when that beast of burden came right up alongside that person, then he would push up and push over and roll the whole weight of that burden over onto the back of that beast. He would walk alongside the beast. The burden was still there. He simply was no longer carrying the burden. Now he walked freely as the beast by his side carried the burden on his behalf. And that is the word which is used in this verse. So when the verse says, casting all your care upon me, it literally means, let me be your beast of burden. Your shoulders were never made to carry the weight that you're carrying. Call upon me. I'll come alongside, push up, push over, and roll the whole weight of it over on me, and let me carry your burden on your behalf. That's what that verse means. Then it says, casting all your care upon him. This particular word for care is the Greek word for anxiety, fret, worry. But what is really interesting is when the Bible says he cares for us, it is exactly the same word which means you would translate it because he is fretful over you. And the whole idea is God wants to alleviate us of our burdens so much. He is hovering over us, fretting over us, wanting to take the burden off of us, longing that we would push it up and over onto his shoulders. Then the next verse says, be sober. Everybody say, be sober. Be sober. Be sober. Well, what happens when you're drunk? And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands for people who could give a personal testimony. But I think some of us know that when you're drunk, you don't feel things right. Your emotions are exaggerated. Things that are not funny, you laugh about. Things that are serious, you may not take serious. When you're drunk, you hear things that aren't said. You say things that you later regret, and you see things that aren't really there. <laughs> and likewise, when you are consumed with worry, you become so emotionally affected that you begin to imagine scenarios that could never happen, not in a million years, but they become activated in your mind, and you worry and fret over these things, that could never even happen. Someone says something, you can't hear them clearly because you're so worried you hear everything through the filter of your worry. And I want to give you an example from my life. 
Back in the early days in the city of Riga, when Denise and I were building our first big building, seems like we've been building buildings forever. No one had ever built a church building for 60 years in the city of Riga. We were the first. God told us to build it. We went to the government to get permission, and the government gave us permission with a stipulation. And the stipulation was the building had to be completely built in 22 months or they would confiscate the building. So in addition to all the money that we were believing for our regular ministry, now Denise and I had to believe for four and a half million dollars cash so that we could build a building in 22 months. And Denise and I made the first investment. We bought the piece of land. It cost $250,000. Things have changed so much in recent years that piece of land just appraised for $20 million. $20 million. But Denise and I made the first investment. We had $250,000. We planted the seed, praise the Lord. We purchased the land. Then we had enough money to bulldoze to begin to build the building. And the building was huge. It was the size of a football field. And because the ground was peat moss, they had to keep digging and digging and digging and digging until finally they hit solid ground. And they dug down almost 15 feet before they hit solid ground. So now they had to remove 15 feet of dirt, the space of an entire football field. And I stood and watched as dump trucks hauled away truckload after truckload after truckload of the richest peat moss all the time thinking, how could we package it and send it to the United States? <laughs> they just dumped it in the river. And then when the hole was dug, we ran out of money. <laughs> and I would go walk through that hole And the devil would speak to me. Stupid. You dug a big hole. You don't even have the money to pay for the gravel to fill it. All you have is a big hole. Stupid. The whole nation's going to laugh at you. This was a stupid thing to do. Wow. I try to shake that off. But yet I knew the Lord had told me to do this. And I would walk through that hole from one end to the other, praying in tongues, trying to hold myself together. And I was so thankful that winter came and snow fell because now I could tell everybody we stopped building because of the weather. <laughs> the truth was we didn't have any money, and I didn't know where the money was going to come from. But by the next spring, money began to come in. And we paid for the gravel, and then the sand, and then the gravel, and the sand, and the gravel, and the sand, and then the rebarb. And finally, it was time to pour the concrete. I remember when those big trucks pulled up, truck after truck after truck, and the concrete poured out of those trucks. And then they brought in the grinders to grind it off and sand it down. I literally got on the ground and kissed that pavement because everything we had was in that foundation. Everything. And then again, we ran out of money. And if this wasn't finished in 22 months, the government was going to confiscate everything that we had. So I would go home at night and I would lay in the bed next to Denise, and she would just lay there so peacefully. <sighs> I'd turn this way, and then I'd turn that way, and then I'd turn this way. My heart was beating so hard I could feel my heart, could feel my body moving on my side of the bed. I said, Denise, pray with me. She said, oh, honey. Just give it to the Lord. 
Honey, don't you know worry's a sin? Oh, that always makes you feel better when somebody tells you worry is a sin. Now, that really made me feel good. It meant I was in sin 100% of the time. And a group of partners came from the United States. And of course, when people come to see you, you take them to dinner. So we took them to dinner. I'm smiling. So glad you're here. My mind was not with those partners. I was wondering where we were going to get the $200,000 we needed by next week. Smiling, talking, privately saying to Denise, where are we going to get $200,000? Ricky, just give it to the Lord. <laughs> so all of a sudden, while we were at that dinner, my telephone rings. And it is George and Terry. And they said, Rick, we don't know why, but we feel today we were supposed to call and tell you that our church is going to send $100,000 for your building program. Oh, I hung the phone up. I said, praise the Lord. Denise, $100,000. I began to finally eat my meal and realized, where are we going to get the other $100,000? I said, Denise, where are we going to get the other $100,000? She said, Rick, don't you see what the Lord just did? I said, yes, I'm very grateful for what he just did, but it's not enough. We need $200,000. She said, just trust the Lord. I said, what, do you think the phone's going to ring and somebody else is going to give us another $100,000? And God is my witness. <laughs> Immediately the telephone rang. And it was Gloria. And she said, Rick, you sent us a letter a while back, and it came off the fax machine and slipped under our bed. And she said, I just found that letter. You need money for your building program, and Ken and I feel like we're supposed to send you $100,000. And we're going to send it today. I hung the phone up. I said, Denise, this is amazing. We just got a second call with $100,000. And I began to eat. And then I thought, wait a minute. George and Terry, Kenneth and Gloria, that's all one ministry. What if they're both talking about the same $100,000? And I began to worry. And I knew I needed to call to clarify, was this the same 100,000 or was this a different 100,000? But then I worried that I would sound like I was an ingrate. A uh, hello, is that 100,000 or 200,000 you're giving me? I am not kidding you. Worry just devoured my life. It just ate me up. One night I couldn't sleep, tossing, turning. I walked down the hallway of our apartment down to my desk, 2 o'clock in the morning, laid my head on my desk. I just began to cry. I said, Jesus, there's nobody else to call. Everybody I know with money has already given money. <laughs> and I don't even know if you have any more money. <laughs> That's because when you're inebriated with worry, you don't think right. You don't think right. And all of a sudden, there was a tap on my shoulder. I thought, oh my gosh, it's a visitation. <laughs> it's Jesus. He's tapping on my shoulder. I sat up, 
looked to my side. And there was our nine-year-old son, Joel. I said, Joel, what are you doing? He said, Daddy, something woke me up and told me to come down here. Why are you crying, Daddy? I said, oh, Dad's just kind of worried about money. And Joel said, oh, Dad, hasn't God proven himself faithful to you yet? And you know what happened? That word from my son is what started the process of me walking free from worry. When I look at my past, I have no que reason to ever question the faithfulness of God, and neither do you. You've been through times much harder than the ones you're going through right now. You had times when you didn't think there'd be food on your table. But I know for a fact by looking at people that everybody has food on their tables. God is faithful. Let's all say that. God is, God is faithful. He has never let you down. And the problem is you're not casting your burden on him. It weighs you down until you become inebriated with the care of it. And you can't think right. You can't see right. And do you know statistically most marital conflicts happen when one spouse or two spouses are completely covered with care and anxiety? Those are the moments when they say things they wish they had not said. Those are the moments when their emotions are exaggerated because the human body was never designed by God to carry that. It breaks your health. It affects your mind. It makes your blood pressure go up. God never made us to be dominated by worry, fret, and anxiety. And Peter says, casting all your care upon him. Call him alongside. Let him be your beast of burden. Push up, push over, roll it over onto his back. The load may still be there, but you're no longer the one carrying it. Now Jesus walks alongside with you as you are completely free, and he carries it on your behalf. Be sober. The Greek could literally be translated, think straight, not like a silly drunk. Then it says, be vigilant. This word vigilant is the Greek word Gregorio. If your name is Greg, that's where your name comes from. This word vigilant, the Greek word Gregorio, is only used, it's never used any other time, to describe that moment when an enemy is coming to attack you and you are to be on your guard. A newer translation might say, be watchful, or it may even say, be on your guard. And then he tells us why. Because who? Your adversary, the who? The devil. First of all, let's look at this word adversary. This word adversary is the Greek word antidikos. The word anti means against. The word dikas is the word for righteousness. And when you compound the two words together, the word adversary means one that is anti-righteousness. He hates you for no other reason than you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And everything in him is anti-righteousness. And if you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it means he is anti-you. He is against you. He will oppose you. He will do everything he can to take you down. But what else is interesting is this word adversary, the Greek word antidikos, is the old term for a prosecutor in a court of law. So you could translate it, the prosecutor, the devil. Well, now what does the devil do? When he comes to you, he says, you have no right to claim a miracle. You haven't been giving your tithe. And he pulls up a fact just like a prosecutor in a court of law. 
Who are you to believe that God is going to touch your body? And he pulls up a fact. When you know that you have been abusing your body, and he reaches into your past, dredging to find something that he can use to prosecute you and thereby nullify your faith. And the Bible says he is the devil. Everybody say devil. This word devil is so important. The Greek word diabolos. The word dia, D-I-A, which conveys the idea of total penetration. The word balos, B-A-L-O-S, from the word balo, which means to throw something like a ball or to throw something like a rock. But when you compound these two words together, it forms the word diabolos, which is one who comes with something in his hand, some kind of a sharpened instrument. And with that thing in his hand, he begins to hurl it against your mind, striking you once, striking you again, pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding and pounding until finally, dia, he penetrates the mind. And when he penetrates the mind, he then paves a road into your brain. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the what? The wiles of the devil. That word wiles is the Greek word methodos. The word meta means with. The word odos is the word for a road. And it's where you get the term for the odometer that is in your car. It comes from this Greek word, odos. Well, when you compound these two words together, it tells us that the devil operates with a road or he has an avenue of attack. There is purpose to his attack. He's not just randomly trying to take you down. He is very purposeful. He knows exactly where to go. He knows exactly what to target. And his primary target is your mind and your emotions. And if he can penetrate into your mind, then build a stronghold. And by the way, sometimes strongholds are very logical. In fact, the worst strongholds are logical strongholds. Illogical strongholds are easy to recognize because they are so ridiculous that eventually you realize this is the devil talking to you. A logical stronghold is when you have sown your finances and you're believing God for a miracle, but according to the paper, you see that there's no way out. And the devil speaks to you logically and says, there's no way out. There's no deliverance for you. And that stronghold then begins to weigh you down. And the devil from this place in your mind begins to dictate to you, tell you what you're going to have, what you're not going to have, what you're going to receive, what you're not going to receive. And he thereby begins to control you your mind, your emotions, what you believe, what you receive. Has anybody ever experienced what I'm talking about? Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. One night I was flying into the city of Tulsa. And as we flew into Tulsa, I was up in the airplane, a private plane. The engines were loud. But all of a sudden I heard a noise that was not coming from inside the airplane. And it was loud. And I said to the pilot, what is that noise? He said, it's the lions. We're flying over the Tulsa Zoo. And every night at this time, we can hear the lions as we fly into Tulsa. And I was shocked. 
that from that low position as we flew in with the sound of the engines, we could hear the roar of the lions roaring because it was time to eat. And here's the way it is when the devil first starts to speak to you about worry. It begins with a little thought. At first, it's a whisper. If you don't take authority over it, the whisper gets a little louder. If you don't take authority over it, it gets louder and louder and louder and louder until finally your mind is filled with the roar that you will never get out of this situation. It will never change. This is an impossible predicament. The roar in your head. A roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, which means he's not able to devour everybody. He's seeking whom, whom he's able to devour. Well, who is the one that he's most easy, easily able to devour? The one that's carrying his own load. You've got to keep the whole thing in context. The one that's carried, weighed down, carrying the load. He is nearly broken. His mind and his emotions are not thinking right. He is easy prey for the devil to attack, and that is the one that the devil is looking for. But when a believer is carefree, trusting the Lord, has no weight of any situation in his life, he is almost not attackable in his mind and his emotions. And when the Bible says, whom he may devour. I always thought that word devour meant to pounce on the victim, to chomp with his teeth, to eat the meat. But in fact, it's the Greek word pino, P-I-N-O, which means to slurp up the remains. There's no meat left. It's gone. All that's left is the liquid laying on the ground. And now the lion is hovering low, licking up the juices of the victim that is already gone. Devoured. That does not have to be you. I can tell you there was a time when that was me. And my precious wife, come with me, Denise. She Love this woman. She would say, Ricky, let's pray together. And I didn't want to do that. Because she was just going to freely give it to the Lord and tell me to give it to the Lord. She was right. But my mindset was it was impossible to be totally free. So I had health problems. I had a bleeding ulcer. I had heart palpitations. I had an irregular heartbeat. I had terrible blood pressure. All of that. Until the night that Joel said, Ah, Dad, hasn't God proved himself faithful to you yet? Now, I believe there's another key to getting free. You get a little older. And the older you get, you realize how frugal it is just to waste all your time worrying and not sleeping at night. Age helps just a little bit. When you look back on your life, you see you have survived everything that you shouldn't have survived. You're still here. You're doing fine. Everything you thought you would make it through, you've made it through every bit of it. You're still doing fine. And today, I am so totally free so totally free. I don't worry about anything. Never. Never. We're right now building a great big building in the city of Moscow. $23 million. 
Hey, that's a pretty big project in case anybody didn't know that. For a missionary? My administrator says, where are we going to get that money? I said, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? I don't know. Pastor, you're not concerned about this? Uh-uh. Pastor, how can you not be concerned about this? Because it's not my project to start with. It belongs to Jesus, and therefore it is his responsibility to carry the weight of it. That is so true about your church. That is true about your ministry. It belongs to him. And when we take it into our own hands is when we begin to feel the weight of it. It's all his, my friends. It's all his. It's his, Billy. The bills are his. Everything's his. Turn to your neighbor and say, the bills belong to Jesus. The bills belong to Jesus. Just like our precious brother taught us in the last session. Wasn't that wonderful? Right now, I want us just to surrender it to the Lord. Brother Copeland started this session like this, and I want to end it like this. Just raise your hands to heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive us for carrying those things that are not ours to carry. Forgive me for the sin of worry. Today I repent. I give it to you. All of my fears, all my concerns, all my needs, my shoulders are not big enough. And I'm rolling it over on you. And from this moment forward, I'm going to let you be my beast of burden. Walk alongside me and carry these things so I can be free. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's thank him. Let's thank him, Brother Copeland. Let's thank him. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Just raise your hands. Just worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Just worship him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, continue to praise the Lord. Just continue to praise and worship. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord Jesus.